What's up, y'all? My name is Ian Edwards, and welcome to the Soccer Comic Rant. Uh, we're going to talk about Manchester United versus Man City. And Manchester, unfortunately, is not red. Uh, we're going to talk about, look at Lee's face. If you're listening, you can't see Lee's face. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah now I'm throwing but yes we're going to talk about that debacle uh, I don't even know why I'm wearing a Man United shirt but you know what actually it's not that bad it's not that bad I didn't think it was as bad I didn't expect to win so the people who didn't expect us to win and then are, who are outraged that we didn't win I don't understand I get it there's always a hope that you might win but this was 99% almost guaranteed a Man City victory, especially with our lineup. We're going to talk about the championship and how Southampton are doing. I think they're fourth. So, all right, Lee, you, 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 you were in range of coming back up to join us, and we'll take your place in the championship next year. Uh, we're going to talk about Liverpool, Arsenal, and Spurs, and maybe even throw Villa in there. Who are the best of the rest? Because we, Man City, you got to give them respect. They're the treble winners, so they're the best in the Premier League, whether they're at the top of it right now or not. But who are the best of the rest? Uh, Messi won his eighth Ballon d'Or, only his eighth. I mean, what a waste of talent. You shouldn't really... <laughs> get his stuff together. How are you going to have that much talent and only win eight Ballon d'Or? But we'll talk about the three top finalists and, you know, how, what the official order was. And uh, is there anything else, Lee, that I forgot to mention? We'll talk about Caribou Cup games coming up midweek and what's going on, you know, the games to watch at the end of the weekend. And I think that's it. And yeah. you just remember. You know? All right. So what up, man? Uh, we got... Stand-up comic, Southampton fan, Lee Hudson joining us from England. What's the deal, fam? I'm good. The clocks uh, changed here yesterday, oh. so this is an hour earlier for me, so I'm slightly more awake today than I usually am. <laughs> uh, and... <laughs> um, so, no, no, it's all good. Um, yeah, interesting interesting weekend of football to discuss. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm looking forward to getting into it. <laughs> All right, let's just rip the band-aid off the the cut and just get this man new thing out the way. And <laughs> Manchester versus Man City, we lost three nothing. Uh, but so I was traveling when the game started, and Martin. Like, normally when we're talking about a game, we talk in a group chat, right? Mm. So I can avoid the group chat because I'm like, I didn't watch the game yet, so I don't want to know the score. There's going to be reactions in the group chat. So Martin texts me so I can know that it's going bad. And it's like, bro, you know I'm traveling. Like... That's just Why that's just Martin doing mind things. That's yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And speaking of Martin, Josh Martin, a comic, he's a Man City fan that now lives in New York. He texts me too, and then Bobby <laughs> Lee texts me. <laughs> so everyone for, coming out the woodwork. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm getting hit, and I'm like, I didn't even see. I got to lose this game twice, like through, <laughs> through Texas. And then when I get home, I got to watch it and see us. But I think the way they were talking made it seem way worse. So when I actually watch it, I was like, ah, three nothing ain't bad. I thought, like, we've been beat before, like <laughs> six, seven. We've taken sixes and seven. So a three nothing <laughs> is like, whew. And I mean, the bad thing is that it was at home and we normally beat City at home. And you could tell the City players were relieved in their post-game press conference, like Bernie Nardo Silva and Haaland, like it's tough for them to win there, no matter where they are in the table. They've had a tough time at uh, United itself. So you could see their relief. 
there's a lot of criticism being leveled at Ten Hag. And uh, I, I get some of it and I don't get some of it. So here's a major thing. Let me ask you a question. Why is Man City better than Man United? Uh, strategy, I think. Because um, money-wise, United, I don't think, are that far behind in terms of spend. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we're just ahead stra- of Yeah, just strategy. Like, you know, City had a plan. They wanted to get Guardiola. They hired, like, the ex-Barca directors and sporting directors like in advance to try and then persuade him to come. And then once they got Guardiola in, they bought him the players he needed and he wanted. Um, and he's got a style of play, which is very defined. He's very good at coaching it. He's done it. He's proven it, at, you know, the biggest clubs in the world, Barcelona and Bayern Munich, like two of two monster clubs. So having him come in to city at the time he did was almost a downgrade. Um, because City hadn't won anything European-wise at that point. Um, they'd won the Premier League, but they weren't like a, a monster of a club like Barca or Bayern were. They were on the way, um, but he's gone there and he's taken them to that next level just by, yeah, by doing that and, and the longevity of him being there for the time he's been there as well. Um, you know, I think that Man United, he's like, the man, any every manager who's come in since Ferguson has come in and dealt with a squad that wasn't ever in as good as place as the one that Guardiola walked into at City. They'd already started building that team piece by piece. You know, De Bruyne was already there, company was already there, um, Fernandino was already like leaders. There were winners already that at that club. Whereas at United, it's it feels like a you know a real like box of broken toys kind of thing. It's, uh, there's there's no real strategy behind anything, it seems there. And obviously they've they've given Ten Hag some of the players he wants. And now it looks like he doesn't really know what to do with them. Like he doesn't know what to do with Anthony. Um, he's, you know, I don't know what happened to Casemiro and Ericsson. They're not looking like the players they did last season at all. Um, everything just looks very disjointed. Like Rashford, is a far better player for England right now than he is for Man United. Um, he's still showing flashes of it, but other than that purple patch he had last season, he sort of seems to have regressed a little bit this season in terms of output. Um, I like Hoyland, but I don't think he's being used properly. I don't think his strengths are being played to. Um, Bruno looks world-class one week. It looks like a amateur some some other weeks. Um yeah, and then obviously the injuries at the back don't help. You know, as soon as I saw the lineup for this game, I was like, okay, um, I don't think United are going to be getting anything. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, you're going up against one of the best attacks in the world with with Evans and Maguire at the back. They might get you through some Premier League games. They'll get you past Sheffield United. They'll get you past Burnley. Barely. But they ain't getting past, Man- <laughs> they ain't getting you over the line against Man City. That's not happening. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just a club that's, it's it's just evidence of of messed up strategy time and time again. And I like some of the ideas, like the idea to get Ten Hag in and, and back him is a good idea, but I think the execution's been poor. Um, so, I mean, I don't know where, where anyone involved goes from here because, I mean, the takeover needs to happen or you know, part buyout from Radcliffe needs to happen. Something needs to happen. And then some changes at sort of sporting director level. There's talk of maybe Paul Mitchell coming in, who's worked at Southampton, Tottenham, Leipzig, um, Monaco before. He's a smart dude. Um, Be interesting to see if he comes in, what he can do. Um, Get rid of Arnold um, or the other person who's in there with him as well. Um, Yeah. It just, it, seems, it just seems like a bit of a mess of a club. And I don't think that can be, you know, you can't pin that all on Harry Maguire like some fans do or all on Ten Hag like some Why fans not? do. That's... <laughs> Why can't you just... just pin it all on Harry Maguire? What's, that's, <laughs> that's funny. But, so, I, I basically... Just, it's an easy, easy scapegoat, isn't it? No, easy, know, it's I an know, easy I scapegoat. It's, it's an easy scapegoat. <laughs> it, it points to a time specifically where everything was kind of going wrong. But 
the first thing you said, I asked you a broad question, right? So the answer could have mm. been anything. It could have been any person. But your answer was right at the top. Strate strategy and structure, mm. like the top of the club, right? So here's the amazing thing about fans and pundits. So I'm watching this club every week, and I'm trying to figure out what's wrong with this club. Because when I see them play, it doesn't seem like they're in a hundred percent. You could just tell, like you could see mm -hmm. a bad team play and see them fully committed and the energy wise. And even if they can't score, they're not that good tactically or skill. You can see it a hundred percent. You don't see it when you watch Manchester United play, you don't see it. So that's why we barely beat the teams we're supposed to like destroy and why we were definitely going to lose to Man City. And the reason why you don't see it, and you are, whether you know it or not, agreeing with Gary Neville, and I am too, because the first place you went with your answer was the top, the structure. And the fans know the club is broken. Every week, something comes out to indicate that the club is broken. Off the field, on the field, in the board office, as far as the sale, the way the club is run, which is a main thing that you pointed at. And if the fans know it and moan about it all the time, right? What about the people who work there? What about the players? You think they don't know it? Because us fans go on their Instagram and remind them and they're being talked about on the news, on all the major sports, networks constantly about what's wrong and to if you think that players should just play and that none of this bothers the players psychologically you're wrong mm -hmm. like if anybody here has ever worked at a place that you knew was going down and tell me that you could put 110 percent into a place that you know was coming underwater. You couldn't, you couldn't. And that's why the same players has failed under multiple coaches. They know this shit ain't right. They know, and it affects them, you know? And then not only shit ain't right, we got injuries. Ten Hag knows shit ain't right, but he can't say it because he has to work with the people who hired them, who are a major part of why it ain't right. So it's like, you, you puts him in a position where he can't be fully honest in the media, which affects how he coaches. He can't be fully honest with the players or with the owners because you, you're just stuck in a spot where everything ain't right and you have to hang on for yourself. And if you have to hang on for yourself, it's, you're not even hanging on for the full team. So the structure being wrong led us to like not have a sporting director, to not have a style of play before we buy players and get a coach to fit that style of play and the coach get the coach players to fit his style of play, which is the United style of play, and to also to get, you know, even if Ten Hag who has made some good buys, but he's made some bad buys. But if he has a sporting director he can trust, that can be like, no, you shouldn't get that player. Get this player, even though he's the coach and he wants the player that he wants, he might be like, this structure is good. It's been working before I got here. I trust it now. But now mm -hmm. he's just going on like, like the, the structure is so broken that the people are supposed to be telling and telling Ten Hag who we should buy or saying, no, we shouldn't get that guy, we should get this guy. They can't tell him because they have no track record to back themselves to go against him when he decides to buy people like Anthony, you know what I mean? Mm. Or Mason Mount, you know? And then even if those players are not bad and they're eventually going to become good. They're still being injected into a broken structure. And once they get there, they know it's broken. And it's like, you see the 
other place where they're before you exuding that it's broken and you might try to be enthusiastic at first but then the overall reality of the situation is going to overwhelm you and you're going to become a part of it and help to magnify it so that's where we lost this game <laughs> you know what i'm saying and that's where we're going to lose a lot of games until we get this shit together it, it, yeah there's ex players and everybody saying but the coach should just make people play on the field but we got injuries and the structure ain't right and it's psychological everything is psychological man perceptive perception is everything you know like somebody's perception or the reality of something can make you and affect you psychologically and how you react to something or how you do something. And I feel like the structure or lack of structure is, you know, just, you, you listen to a coach who is stuck if you're a player and can't do anything, you know, to, just to the point, like, he can't even replace anybody that needs to be replacing because we ain't got no money. So then the fear of that as a player is like gone, you know, but I don't want to drag this out, but I just think that's where we lost the game. Besides that, I think Onana had a really good game. It's, it's crazy to let three goals in and <laughs> still have a great game. One was a penalty that shouldn't have been given. There's no way that penalty should be given, especially 10 minutes after the referee didn't call it. Bar is like, excuse me, let's go back 10 minutes. I think there was almost a foul and we want to give Man City, the treble winners, who are already dominating the game, a penalty for no reason. You know what I'm saying? Like for no reason, which changes how we play because Ten Hag took out Amrabat, who we needed, and put in an offensive player because Man United have been so bad at scoring goals. We score goals at last minute and win games at the last minute against terrible teams. He couldn't afford to wait to get offensive. He had to do it immediately just to guarantee there would be more time to try to score a goal against the best team in Europe, the treble winner. So it, and then from that moment on, you give away the penalty. It's only a matter of time before the rest of the dominoes fall and Man City are going to be up three. So that's my dissertation on like why we lost this game because Man City is just better from the top down and United since Alex Ferguson left and the sporting director that we had left structurally. We haven't been intact. We're the only major team without a sporting director and without a good, like, infrastructure. And we, and it shows on the pitch. And it's going to show on the pitch. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's um, worth highlighting that what you said about Onana because he's coming for a lot of criticism. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, over the last like month or so. So... You know, I mean, that save from Haaland's header was world class. Like, he had no right to be getting that. I mean, Haaland could have probably put it a little bit more in the corner, but it's still a world class save. And, yeah. you know, it wasn't that he wasn't that far off getting the other Haaland header. Um, mm -hmm. It was just all his, all his momentum was going in the opposite direction. So he struggled with that one a bit. But um, yeah, that and the, the 1v1 save as well, where he stood up big, didn't himself get beaten easy. Yeah. Because um, that's the sort of shot he was letting in a few weeks ago. But like he was getting he he people were just finding holes in him on the one v ones, but he managed to yeah he looked like he'd been doing some work on that so mm -hmm. um, yeah credit to him I mean he he had a good game there's you, know, you got to pick the the small rays of silver lining out of that miserable day. <laughs> also, you know again people are going to come down on Rashford and said he had a bad game, but it's like. It's like inches to having a from a bad game to a good game. Like there was one pass he made a cross field to McTominay, and McTominay had a shot on goal and it mm -hmm. got saved. But if that had gone in, that's an assist. 
And then also yeah. there was a long ball over the top. I forgot. I think I forgot who got him that ball and he chested it down. He had a city defender on him. He cut, got rid of the defender, beat the keeper, took the shot, and it just went barely wide. And that's a goal and an assist. We would have lost, but would you be saying, like the fans are saying, oh, he had a terrible game. It's just uh, sometimes you do everything except. Fans are so pissed, they won't even accept the good things. Like we wouldn't even praise Rashford fully until the end of the season when we saw the 30 goals. And they were like, oh, he had a good season. But, you know, people will complain in between and all of that and rewrite history, not just about Rashford, just about everything, but give Ten Hag time, don't fire him, fix the structure. Hopefully this one quarter sale will help us and uh, we'll get a sporting director and we'll figure this thing out from the top. We have to fix this thing from the top, not from the middle. You know what I'm saying? You got to pick this thing from the bottom up. Uh, You want to talk about Messi winning the Ballon d'Or? Yeah, hot news tonight. Um, I mean, I fully agree with it. Um, you know, he, I mean, I don't want to say carried a team to the World Cup because, you know, there was a lot of players on the Argentina team that worked hard, but I think they worked hard for him. Yeah. Like you could see almost like he, he was inspiring those guys to, to elevate him up in return for him elevating them up kind of thing. Um, and yeah, I mean, you could just see like that he was a man on a mission um, in that world cup. And it was the one stick that people were using to beat him with in terms of his career and his status within the game. Um, you know, you've never done this, you've never done that. And then, you know, he wins the, he wins the Copper America with Argentina. So that leveled up him against Ronaldo's, Euros with Portugal, um, winning the con you know the continental version of of, of that trophy, and then um, you know then going and taking the World Cup. I mean, I already had him clear of Ronaldo anyway in my mind. Yeah, um, it's it, you know, and and it's an entirely subjective no, it's um, not. debate. <laughs> I'm a I'm a um, I'm a United fan. I'm a Real Madrid fan, <laughs> and it's always been messy for me. And oh, pe people will gladly five. have that argument. <laughs> you can have it, but you ain't yeah, gonna yeah, win yeah. it if you're yeah, if yeah. you're saying Ronaldo. <laughs> like Ronaldo is dope. It doesn't mean it ain't dope. Yeah, Even, he's got five. Nobody, no other player's gotten five. And there's been some mm. great players in the world, but five. This, if he's so great and he got five, how great is Messi if he mm. got eight? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, like I said, I, I I had him as the number one before the World Cup and before this additional Ballon d'Or anyway. But I think it's right that he got acknowledged for for what he did, you know, winning that World Cup. And then because some people are saying, oh, he's at Miami now. It's, it's 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 given on the year, like over the last year. So it's the World Cup's part of that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he's 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 a worthy winner. Um, I, I fully actually I fully agree with the top three as well. Um, right. with Haaland and Mbappe in there because Haaland was you know a machine he stepped up to a level that he hadn't been at previously um, mm -hmm. and just blew people away um, you know treble winner and then Mbappe I think deserves to be up there just because he's consistent for his club and I thought he was the second best player at the World Cup behind Messi um, you know yeah. he, he almost single-handedly dragged his team to a World Cup as well in that final Um so yeah, I, th I think I think I think it was a, a deserving top three. You know, there's the presence, the, the top ten. I've pretty much agreed with most of the top ten, to be honest. If I run it down mm. real quick, it was Messi obviously one, Haaland two, Mbappe three. Agree with all that. De Bruyne fourth. I agree with that. Um, mm. You know, he could have maybe made the top three interchangeable with one of the others because I thought he was world class throughout. Rodri was fifth, which I quite like because they don't always give players like that. The credit they deserve because um, mm -hmm. he does stuff that you know people don't always appreciate within the game Vinicius number six I can't really hate on that because he you know everything good Real Madrid did he was 
he was active in almost all of it. Um, mm-hmm. Alvarez seventh. I thought Alvarez, I thought was too high. Um, he played well for Argentina at the World Cup. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's what's got him in here as well. Because I think for City, he didn't really contribute that much. Um, I think, you know, if you look at the treble winning team, because Bernardo Silva makes it in at nine, uh, Osimen is eight and Modric is 10. The one for me that I thought was too low was Gundogan being 14th. Because I thought he was, he was like the match winner for City so often last season uh, in big moments as well. Um, so I thought he deserved to be higher. I'd have like the fact that Alvarez is seventh and Gundogan's 14th doesn't quite add up for me. Uh, but I mean, he had a big World Cup, Alvarez. So I'll 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 let it one go. Yeah, I, I, I'll I'll interject on the Alvarez thing, then go back to the beginning of what you were saying. The Alvarez mm-hmm. thing is because he has this interesting stat where he won football in mm-hmm. a full year. So he won the treble. <laughs> And the World Cup, and so yeah. they they put him that high because of that. Like he completed football in a, I guess, calendar year or in a, in a year. So I think that's why they put him that high. It's like when a, uh, is it Janinho from Chelsea was like up there for the Ballon d'Or because they won the Euros, he won the Champions League, and something else, you know. So, but uh, just to go back to what you were saying, this is why Messi deserves a Ballon d'Or. And it's because of what you said. Like, the players wanted to get him a World Cup so bad, his teammates. Like, normally you're supposed to want to get win the World Cup for your country and for yourself. But they wanted to get it for him. To end. Football has this love that I rarely see anywhere else where players are in love with the guy that can do what they can't do. It's like this respect, like we're all playing the same sport, but this guy can play so well. And even though I'm the same age or younger than him, I worship him. And it's like their blind worship of him led them to do the impossible because Argentina's had better teams in this that didn't win. But because Mm. this was the last chance, his age, and they knew it, there's like, it's now or never. And it takes the pressure off them playing for their country and for themselves when they're playing for a focal point like Messi. And for Messi to be so good that they wanted to do this for him and then they help him and he helps them, that's Ballon d'Or shit. Because he's, this is why I always thought he was better than Ronaldo. Because he's not a selfish player. Like, so he'll, if you're not a selfish player and you're the best in the world, but you, your teammates can te- tell that you care about them and you're trying mm-hmm. to get them something, they're like, I want to pay this guy back for what he's trying to do for me and what he's been trying to do for me. And that's where Ronaldo falls short in comparison to Messi. It's not just, again, it's about skill, it's about dedication, it's about time, but it's also about like the emotion you create, your emotional situation and the psychology that you can create to make football work for you at its maximum best. And Messi definitely does that. And as far as the other three, it is the right order, but it's so funny how Mbappe finished third, right? He finishes third. He was one win away from finishing first, <laughs> right? But he doesn't win the World Cup, so he finishes third instead of first. Because then Haaland, who finished second, would have still finished second because he won the tre- treble. But you'd have to have given the Ballon d'Or to Mbappe if France won the World Cup and Messi would have finished third. So that's that's the fine line of football. And also, you know, it's crazy to win the treble and not win the Ballon d'Or. But, you know, I feel like Messi's won his last Ballon d'Or 
Uh, but oh, yeah. he was up against the two people who are going to take over from him and mm. Ronaldo. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. it's like you see him get the Ballon d'Or and you look down to the two people who in the next 10 years, this whole award is going to be about. <laughs> so it's perfect. You know, it's perfect. Yeah, they're, they're going to be, they're going to be winning them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Back to back. They're going to be fighting for that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the MLS has a Ballon d'Or winner. <laughs> so <laughs> if he won the Ballon d'Or, you can't not give him the MLS MVP. <laughs> you can't give it to one of those other names, even though they deserve <laughs> it and they played more games than him this season in the MLS. You're like, this is, it would be crazy for the MLS to throw away the marketing opportunity of naming Messi MLS MVP. It would be, but it'll be financial suicide for them to not do that. You know, so I mean, you know, it's technically smart as well because I guess if they. You know, if they name him as MVP, it gets people talking about all the people that they think should have won mm-hmm. it, which we did last week. Um, yeah. You know, it, it gets people acknowledging what other players in the league have done mm-hmm. by giving it to someone who perhaps didn't deserve it based on what they did, you know, within that league. But, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, it'll definitely strike up, strike up a conversation because you guys brought up some names last week that I never heard of. You made strong arguments for them, but now I'm like, oh, okay, all right. So it'll help the MLS regardless. Uh, so we also want to talk about so Spurs won, Liverpool won, Arsenal won, right? And uh, let me just find this. So if you look at the top, if you look at the standards, Tottenham is first, but ignore that. Ignore that. They're first. Man City's actually third. But if you ask anybody who's going to win the league with 10 games left, you're going to say Man City. So if Man City's going to win the league, they're the favorites because they've earned it over the last decade. Who is the really the best of the? What order is the best of the rest? Is Tottenham between Tottenham, Arsenal, and Liverpool? And let's just throw in Villa for now because they're right there. They're fifth. Like, what's your order for the best of the rest, and why? <laughs> this is this Easy is a question. tough one. This is a real tough one. Um, I mean, you could go moment. through their rosters and stuff and, and look <laughs> like we're just we're just we're just playing right now. We're just, you know. <laughs> I mean, for me, like pound for pound on paper, in terms of the team that I think have the best squad and the most depth out of all of those guys, I would personally say Liverpool. Um, because I think you know Salah's back to form. Um. You know, Nunez is is getting more and more dangerous every week. He's still a little bit inconsistent, but he's he's showing up more often than not now. Um, Jota's just like a quiet assassin. You give him a chance, he scores. Um, Sobolai is is I think not getting enough credit for what he's doing there. Um, you know, they've dealt with with the absence of Robertson since the international break. He's been injured. They've had quite nice games, but. Simicast has come in and done his job. Um, you know, McAllister's going about his business. Um, that whole that midfield revamp they've had, it looks nice. Um, so yeah, I think for me, I would slightly favour Liverpool's squad, but it, there's not much in it between them and Arsenal. Um, Arsenal, yeah, you know they've made smart buys. Rice is looking like a monster for them in the middle. Um, you know, Jesus, when he played against Sevilla the other week, when, I mean, his fitness is, must be frustrating because he was in the stands again against Sheffield United. Um, I mean, obviously, Nketiah stepped up, but he stepped up against Sheffield United. Can he step up against some of the bigger teams as well? Because he hasn't always done. Um, but, I, I mean, I like that squad. Like, there's just so much class in that Arsenal squad as well. 
Um, when I think about it, it's it, it, it for me. There's not really much in it between them and Liverpool. Um, but I mean, both of them behind Spurs right now. And but for me, at Spurs, the the show, the, you know, the star of the show isn't on the field. The star of the show's in the dugout. Um, as much as he tries to deflect some of it, um, you know, he's the person that's that's brought that squad together. Because on paper, for me, that team is. It's 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 not anywhere near the levels of Arsenal or Liverpool on paper, but right now they're putting in performances and getting results which are you know above them, um, above those two guys. So you you know you got to uh, give them credit for that. I think a lot of people, me included, are waiting for it to fall away. Um, but every week that goes past, they're racking up another win. Um, I think you know I think people are taking them seriously as a side, but. I think the real time we'll see is if, if they're in, I wouldn't even say top four. I'd say if they're in the top three still after the Christmas run, when there's all those fixtures packed in. So at the start of the year, if they're, if they're top three, then they're legit. Um, so I think 10, 10 games is still too early. Like it's promising. If I was a Spurs fan, I'd be so happy right now. Um, just compared to what they were watching under Conte last year, this is already you know, <laughs> even if they end up finishing six now, but still play this kind of football, I think they'll be happy. Um, so I think anything sort of, you know, better than what they were last season is, is a bonus for them now. So I, I, I think, you know, maybe not Martin, but realistic Spurs fans won't be getting too carried away. Um, you know, the ones, the ones <laughs> who are a bit more sensible. And then to be fair, even Martin in his more honest moments, um, <laughs> uh, is acknowledging it as well. So I think for Spurs fans, it's just enjoy the ride and see how long it lasts because it might last. But I think after Christmas, um, start of the year is when we'll see if it's real or not. Um, because I think by then, the likes of you know City, obviously, um, and Arsenal and Liverpool will all, I think, have shown that they've got the quality to last. Um and I, I would still, if I had to put money on it, I would put money on them being the top three, um, City, Arsenal and Liverpool. Um, not necessarily in that order. I don't know what order I'd put them in. I, do, I think City will win the league still. I don't know out of who Arsenal or Liverpool will finish second. Um, but that's where I'd put them. And, uh, you know, you brought up Villa. Um, I think they'll, especially as they go deeper into European competition, I think they'll find it hard to maintain the consistency to, to really keep pace with those guys. But again, they're really impressive to watch. And, Again, it's the guy in the dugout. I think that is the main reason for that because you know he's a he's a top class manager and he's he's brought in smart buys as well. Um, so credit to him and the team around him doing the recruitment because Diaby's a player, um, and he's also rejuvenated some players who were there before that weren't doing much, like Leon Bailey as well. And he seems to be getting another level of performance out of McGinn in midfield and. Uh, you know, he's managing to harness the talents of, of of Watkins and and keep him playing well as well. It's they're they're a fun they're a really fun team to watch. They're one of my favourite teams to watch in the league at the moment. I hate to say it, but Villa and Spurs are, are both Damn. great to watch right now. Um, nothing against Villa, but obviously I you know historically not a fan of Tottenham. Um, so, but they're, they're they're two of the most fun teams to watch. The way they play, um, there's just you know attacking creativity um, and sort of a fearlessness about both of them. So, um, yeah, they're both enjoyable to watch. I think for the two of them, for Villa and Tottenham, a good season will be top six. Um, Spurs, Spurs, I think, have more of a chance of cracking the top four and getting that Champions League spot, um, purely because, obviously, you know, you guys, I think you're too inconsistent to make Champions League this season, as it stands. Chelsea, obviously, way off the pace. Newcastle, I think, are struggling to manage the the extra workload of Champions League and Premier League. I don't think their squad's quite deep enough for it. Um, you know, they can pull off some good results on a one-off like the, the PSG game, but then they lost to Dortmund and then they drew with Wolves. I don't think they're quite... I think it's it's exposing the the weak links in their squad because they've got some really top players, but I think the, the weak spots are getting found out a little bit now, um, having to deal with this sort of schedule. So, um, yeah, I, I can't see... Unless they really dramatically turn around their form. I don't think they'll be up there. So I, I think Spurs got a good chance of finishing top four. Villa, I think, should finish top six. Uh, 
some interesting stuff there, a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, you know what's funny about you mentioning that United probably won't make the Champions League spot? And I agree with you. The only way we can get a Champions League spot this year is if we finish third in our group and fall down to the Europa League and then win the Europa League. Like that's <laughs> <laughs> the easiest route for Manchester United to get into the Champions League next year. To fall out of the Champions League, get knocked out of the Champions League, fall into the Europa League and win the Europa League. It's it's a tough ass route, but it's way easier right now than us finishing fourth in the Premier League against Man yeah. City, Spurs, Arsenal, and Liverpool, and even Villa. And there's other teams ahead of us I'm not even mentioning. So, like, it just based on where we're at right now. Uh, I agree <laughs> you, need to start you, tank- you need to start tanking those Champions League games we got, then. <laughs> we, got to, we just got to start tanking. We got to make sure <laughs> we don't qualify for the, <laughs> for the, for the knockout stage. That's for, that's crazy. That's some Mourinho shit. That's some shit Mourinho would do. You know, <laughs> he'd plan the exit just so that we could advance. But uh, Liverpool is. I had my eye on them since the beginning of the season. I knew the season that Pep had last year was an aberration. It was based on not injuries, but the end of a cycle and players aging out and people have to remember that people wanted some people even a lot of Liverpool fans thought "Ah, that's the end of clock you know this is it you know maybe they should fire him like there was people coming on sports talk saying that so that's how emotional people get like they were talking about firing a coach that just took them to four finals he only won two, but he's won the Champions League for them before and the Premier League. And they're like ignoring the facts of the end of the cycle and say, fire him. But they didn't. Smarter heads and cooler heads prevailed. And they replaced the old players with the end of the cycle. And they got the players they got now. And now they're up and running again with a new brand cycle. And I don't think they'll beat City because the good thing is they all they do have players with experience who won it all. But I don't know, just based on the lack of experience of the newer people enough, if the experience of the older experienced players is enough to carry them past Man City. But because of the experience of their other older players from the first cycle combined with the new players with l- lack of experience, I think it's enough to take them past Arsenal. So I think they have a better chance, Liverpool, of finishing second this season than Arsenal, who finished second last season. And and I think they both and I think I just think Liverpool is better than Spurs. Spurs is at the top right now. It's after 10 games. But I just think Liverpool is better and deeper than Spurs and has more experience and more pedigree. The thing with Spurs is they are unexpectedly where they are. But towards the end of the season, like after Christmas, that's when you're not just playing teams. You're playing against the pressure of expectation. It doesn't mm-hmm. take long for you, people to expect things from you after you played a certain way. And then, so the, the first 10 games are free. <laughs> You're surprised, it's fun, there's no pressure. But the next 30 games, <laughs> you sit at the top of the table, people are talking about you and pumping you up, and then saying, this is where you should finish it and making it fact. And then you feel the pressure of people's expectations. That's where you have to need the experience and the depth. And I don't think Spurs got that. So I'll put Arsenal ahead of them 
because Arsenal felt that pressure last year and know better how to deal with it this year. And then I, I, I do put Spurs ahead of Villa, but even that could get flipped. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Because Villa's just on one right now. But I just do think that Spurs starting 11 is better than Villa's. But Villa might have more depth. But they both have, like you said, their dugout. That's where their strength is. So they both have. Mm. But, you know, Unai Emery's been here before. He dealt with a bigger team than Villa. No disrespect to Villa. So he still has a chance to edge it Spurs with Villa. And then there's other teams that could come in the picture, like Newcastle, who finished fourth last year. They might not even finish in the top four, you know? So it's it, it's it's bananas. I don't put United in there at all, especially right now. <laughs> but uh, there's one more thing I wanted to address that you said, but I can't remember it now. I don't sound like a dwell on it, but that's that's my my order, and that's why. Uh, and we know that Arsenal won. We know that Liverpool won. You know that Spurs won. I'm trying to, and so uh, let's talk about Chelsea losing <laughs> to mm. Brentford. Was it Brentford? Yeah, um, it's kind of weird because I thought like Chelsea had turned a corner because like they they started off a season like playing well but not getting the results, and then they started picking up some results um, that sort of matched the performances, and then. <laughs> They had that weird game against Arsenal last week where they kind of found themselves 2-0 up, but I didn't really think they deserved to be 2-0 up. The Mudrick goal was a fluke. Um, but then once you're 2-0 up, like, you know, if you've got the right mentality, you shut that game down. Um, however you do it, either by attacking them and killing them off and scoring the third or by just being solid defensively and making sure that you keep that clean sheet. And they just crumbled and Arsenal pulled it back. Um which, yeah, would worry me if I was a Chelsea fan about the mentality of the players. And then, you know, how do they react to that? They go and they play a Brentford team that, you know, Brentford are solid, but they're average in this league. Um, And if you're Chelsea and you're trying to get back up to the upper echelons where they believe they deserve to be, Brentford at home is a game you've got to win. Um, And they get turned over 2-0 which, I mean, Sanchez had to make a couple of good saves as well in that game. Um, so, I mean, I know we have Brentford played defensively pretty solid as well. So, yeah, I mean, Chelsea got to be winning those sort of games. And I think it will frustrate their fans that they thought they'd maybe turn that corner and then, you know, they regress like this. So, all eyes on their uh, their next fixture to see if they can uh, can start you know, picking that form back up again. Um, but their next fixture is Tottenham on Monday next week. So we'll be we'll be talking about that one fresh on the pod um, mm-hmm. after it happens. So that'll be that'll be interesting. So um, yeah, you know, do, does Chelsea's you know does Chelsea get sent back into a spiral, or does Tottenham's winning run come to an end, or is it a draw that bores us all? Um, who knows. Um, but that'll be that'll be a really that'll be a really interesting one to watch. And obviously Poch going back to Tottenham for the first time as well. Oh, yeah. Um there's yeah, there's 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 a lot to to look forward to in that game. Yeah. Uh I didn't trust Chelsea's improved form lately because they still need what they need. And like you mentioned, in the Arsenal game they went up two. Their inexperience and their, you know, cause them to cough up two goals and only end up with a point. And they still need a nine. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. I feel like they might go on runs, but then they're going to be these one losses and two losses in a row, you know, and they might, you know, face three teams in a row and get three wins, but there's going to be these losses that are just going to add up by the end of the year to 
make their season just okay. You know, what they can hope for the most is like a style of play, which I think they have. And at least there's no confusion. We just know what they need. And it ain't a style of play. And needing a style of play is the worst thing to need. They just need experience, more experienced players, and a nine. And a nine will fix most of it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But those things that they need are very important. And they're gonna drop some points. So, but the, but the Brentford thing is shocking because they were dominating that game, and Brentford scored against a run of play, and it was just like the worst thing that could happen to them, especially at home. And then the second worst thing happened at the end of the game when the goalkeeper came up, and I get it, you come up because why not? What if we score, then we salvage a point? And if I don't come up, or if I do come up and they score, uh, so what? We still have no points. Like a one nothing and a 2 nothing gives you the same amount of points. I might as well come up and try to make it 1-1. But even though that's true, the psychology of giving up that extra goal at the end of the game in the way it was given up is super damaging. It's almost like some invisible points were taken away from you just on, yeah. you know, it, it, it feels like more than a, a three point loss. You know what I mean? Yeah. If just, the, just sometimes the nature of it, like psychologically, you can't take that feeling away. It's there. It's yeah, it just adds, adds a gloss of embarrassment, doesn't it? I think to it yes. as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's like United. I was thinking, say they didn't give us that, they give Man City that penalty. And say we hung on. If it was a tie, right? But the game was played the same way it was played. Say Rashford's goal went in. Say his pass to, to, uh, to McTominay. McTominay turned into an assist because McTominay scored. Mm -hmm. We, the pundits like Keane and Gary Neville would still be disappointed in the point we got or the three points. You know what I mean? So that's how you know, you know, there's something wrong with your team. You know what I mean? Like if we'd have hung on. And that's how this Chelsea loss felt. Like the one nothing was bad, but the two nothing was like, oh my God, you know what I mean? And if we'd have beaten Man City the way we played yesterday, it would have still been like, it was luck. We couldn't do it again. <laughs> you know, it's, it, you know, we'd have to, it, it would help us in points, but people would still be it was still be looking at that three points like it didn't really exist because of how we mm -hmm. attained it, you know? So, uh, we could talk about Chelsea versus Spurs next week. Like, cause that's like I'm trying to see what are the big games next weekend. That's the marquee Arsenal versus Newcastle. It's going yeah. to be a vicious affair. That's going to be a vicious affair. Yeah, that's definitely game number two behind uh, Spurs Chelsea. Mm -hmm. Not far behind. Right. The rest of them, nothing really jumps out. I think Forest Villa will be a fun game to watch. Mm, why? Just because I think, I think Forest are in it, you know, they've improved since mm -hmm. last season. And, um, yeah, there's some players there I like, and uh, Villa obviously just like I say, Villa are just one of the most fun teams to watch at the moment, along with Spurs. So uh, I think that'll be that'll be quite a nice open game. Um, but yeah, not much. I mean, I feel for Bournemouth. Um, you know, I think they got their first. I think that was their first win they got at the weekend. Yeah, it was. But it now was. that, but then they go away to Man City, so it's like you know, yeah, you got your first win, you ain't getting a second. Um, not this week anyway. So. Um, 
that that'll be uh, that'll be an interesting one to watch. Um, Brentford West Ham could be intriguing just from a set piece point of view because Brentford are a really strong team on set pieces, and West Ham have got Will Prowse, which by default makes them strong on set pieces because um, they've got some pretty big players that can get on the end of his stuff. So that'll be uh, a very attritional battle of balls going into the box, I think, Brentford-West Ham. Um, and then you guys away to Fulham. I mean, who knows what's going to happen there? <laughs> yeah, who, who knows? <laughs> uh, I, I'll just go back to the Tottenham-Chelsea. It's mm. at Tottenham. Martin feels it's going to be a tough game because Chelsea's like a bogey team for them. But he says bogey team, but it's not a bogey team. Chelsea's just been traditionally better. So (laughs) that's where Tottenham thing is. We're in London and we're a big club, but you haven't won anything. So, of course, no, you you could be a bogey team for them, but they can't be a bogey team for you. They just had a better Premier League experience. They're one of the top clubs in Premier League history. So they're not your bogey team. But... Now you could be their bogey team because you're playing at home. You got this new coach. You got this new style of play. And you have all the components of a team. And it's early in the season where this is a no-pressure game for Tottenham. Like if they win, this just makes them feel better confidence-wise, points-wise, and keeps them at the top of the table. And then you can, you feel like you beat this old Chelsea club that historically has been good, but it's just uh, 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 a weakened Chelsea. But you've beaten Chelsea, so it just makes... And if Chelsea beats Tottenham, they should be confident. But again, they're going to win and they're going to lose. But I give this game to Tottenham. Tottenham. This is Tottenham's game to mess up. It's a no-pressure game. Your fans are going to be in it. Your players are firing in all cylinders. You got Van der Ven. Like, Van der Ven is making Romero look good. Like, the speed of this guy. There were some defensive plays that he made this weekend that are equivalent to Anana saves that Anana made against Haaland this weekend. There was some like the Crystal Palace player is gone and is going to get a one-on-one on goal and Van der Ven catches up with this guy or whoever it was multiple times to just disarm them. His speed is ridiculous. Like Holland's defense with him and Van Dyke, it's preposterous. And this is one thing. Martin's been pretty humble. Like I spoke to him this morning. And he's like, doesn't want to insist. He's not being typical Tottenham, like you said. You know, he's like being very reserved and being respectful. He's like, I'm definitely happy with the beginning of the season, but it's too early. Something never said by a Tottenham fan ever. But <laughs> he's being very reserved. But I, the one thing that I did, I took a shot at him this morning. I said, Man, it's great watching the Tottenham players and seeing the players who are going to become valuable enough for Real Madrid to buy them from you. Like, it's good to see, like, like, like Real Madrid's next central defender, Vanderbilt, de- develop at Tottenham. <laughs> because Tottenham's best players go and end up and become legends at Real Madrid. You know, Bale, Modric. So it's like Tottenham has to win within the next two years something with these guys or Real Madrid is going to buy them and they're not going to win anything with them, you know? So good luck, Tottenham, because there's a plus and a negative to being good when you're not a top team. You know what I mean? Uh, and then Newcastle, Arsenal at Newcastle two top four teams two teams in the Champions League only thing is Newcastle got to play us midweek is Arsenal still in the Caribou Cup let me see yeah they are they got to play 
play uh oh, they got to play West Ham on Wednesday. Mm. So but that's just I think it I just think that's a game of like two teams that don't hold back and they they just go at it. It's, yeah. Yeah, they just go at it. I think it would depend on how much Arsenal rotate as well. Um because they might they might want to chop things up a bit ahead of the Newcastle game, make sure they don't uh don't necessarily have the same eleven out um in that one. So I think if Arsenal go full strength, they win that one. But if they rotate and West Ham take it seriously, then it could go either way. Yeah. Yeah. You you're gonna win the game you take the most serious. Mm. You know, and that you know, you, you have a better chance. So it's like which game does Arsenal take more seriously? This Carling Cup game midweek on Wednesday versus West Ham or the game versus Newcastle on the weekend. They can beat West Ham midweek in the Caribou Cup, but if they rotate, they might have problems. And West Ham, they rotated midweek in the Europa League and they lost. They threw on their starters like late and it wasn't enough. So and they just lost again this weekend in the Premier League. I think West Ham did. So they need a win. That just they don't they need the, the next game they need to win. So they should just go all out for this Caribou Cup. You don't wanna like David Moyes, I know he's a seasoned coach and he knows it's a full season, but these fans they don't really want him. And he's doing good in spite of them. They don't care how good he's doing. They just don't believe in him like that. West Ham fans, mostly. So yeah. he's only safe when he's winning, you know? And he's yeah. just losing, lost losing to Everton isn't a good look. <laughs> yeah, it's not a good look. And you lost the week before. And you lost midweek. You need a win to get these fans off your back. So you he almost has to commit midweek to this game. You know, so we'll see. Uh, did we cover everything? United versus Fulham. Yeah. What's going on in the championship? How? What does Southampton do? Oof. Uh, well, we had the visit of uh, of Wayne Rooney on Saturday. <laughs> um, oh, shit. I mean, I know I'm dressed like he does on the touchline right now. I look at a little bit. Uh, I've got a little bit of that Rooney look going on. Um, but he did not do well, um, as he hasn't done since he's been at uh, since he's been at Birmingham. Which is, um, you know, the fans are on his back already. They were on his back after the last week when they won or when they lost um, the second game of his uh, his tenure. And um, yeah, we beat them fairly comfortably. I think. I got to say, Birmingham were a little bit unlucky. Our first goal was marginally offside, and I thought they could have had a penalty um, earlier in the game as well. But I mean, overall, we deserve to beat them. Um, we did enough in that game. You know, we scored three goals, um, and yeah, I mean, it's just it. Everyone was surprised and shocked by the decision Birmingham made to sack a manager that was doing well and to bring Rooney in purely because he's a name. It's like the guy didn't even make the playoffs in the MLS. That was why he left DC United because he couldn't make the MLS playoffs. And like so many teams get into the playoffs that you need to be really bad to not make the playoffs. Um, And it's like, well, if the fact that he is a known name couldn't inspire an MLS team to scrape into the playoffs, then like, what's he going to do in the championship? Like, I know he sort of did well with with Derby when they had some financial problems, but the squad he had there was really good. Um, the reason they had financial problems because they overspent on the squad that he was managing, um, not just under him, but under the managers previously. So he still, had, even though they had like points deduction and and all this and that happening, they were still a very talented squad. So mm-hmm. I think he did well motivating those players there, but I mean, he's not doing a good job of it at Birmingham. And it'll be interesting to see how long 
he gets there if the results keep going badly because the championship is an unforgiving league. Um, it is not a league where you can just turn up and win games because you're a name or win games because, um, you know, the, the club have got a high profile owner now with, with, with Tom Brady involved um, as part of that ownership group. So it's like those things won't win you games in the championship. You need a good team. You need a good manager um, because it's, yeah, like I say, it's unforgiving. So um, it's, uh, it's because he's, he's not been, he's not been getting any patience from the fans. So he needs to win some games soon. Uh, but I don't think their games are getting any easier. I think their games are staying tough. Like, like I said, they're pretty much all tough in the championship. But let me just have a look at Birmingham City's upcoming games because they are not easy. Oh, yeah, their next game is against Ipswich, who are second in the league um, oh, and doing really well. Um, the game after that is against Birmingham, uh, sorry, it's against Sunderland, who um, have been doing okay this season. They've got Jude Bellingham's brother Joe playing for him as well. Um, so they, if he loses those next two and he goes five games, five losses in a row, then mm -hmm. uh, I think there'll be problems there. Um, they got some winnable games after that, including two of the worst teams in the league and Sheffield Wednesday and Rotherham coming up after that. Uh, and Blackburn will, too, will he so. still be coached by then? <laughs> I mean, he hopes so. Um, whether he will or not, I <laughs> do not know. So, um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see. But, uh, yeah, I mean, like I say, it's the sort of thing where everyone thought it was a weird decision that they made. And it's it's proven so. Who knows? It might turn around. But right now, it's it's looking like a bad decision. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I like Wayne Rooney, ex-United player, legend. But he hasn't really shown me that much coaching wise. And it's, mm. it was an ill advised move for Birmingham to fire a coach that was doing good for an unproven legend of a player named Rain Rooney to be their coach. And it seems it's just like you can't cast, this ain't a reality show. You can't cast like a real team in a real league, you have to like mm. pick. Nobody's going to see the coach play. You know what I mean? Like Spurs did their due diligence, met with Ange, saw what he was doing at Celtic and like, he's won, let's bring him in. And it's like, he's their new Pochettino. Same level of when Pochettino left you guys, like, like, you know, well done, Spurs. You can't, like, we've seen so many teams, especially in the championship, like, and in, and in the Premier League, like, they go for the name, and it doesn't work out. Mm -hmm. But sometimes when they go for those names, those names are names that have won shit before. You went for a name that's never won anything coaching. You know what I mean? Steven, so I was just going to mention Steven Gerrard. Like Villa went for Steven Gerrard because he won something in Scotland and it didn't work out for him at Villa. So Rooney, who's won nothing anywhere. Yeah. What's he going to do in that tough ass league? Yeah. His team came 12th out of 15th in the Eastern Conference in the MLS. Like that's not, I mean, any other manager does that. They ain't getting hired for a, right. a, a, a club at the, you know, top half of the championship. Right. But uh, congratulations to you guys and your win. Before we go to the Fantasy League, did you watch uh, El Clasico? Yeah, I, I didn't watch it live, but I watched it back. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, what a game. Um, yeah, I mean, Barca obviously started strong. Um, they came out. Try it, was, it was a good game as well because both teams were having a go at each other. Both teams were trying to mm -hmm. make chances and um, and win the game, obviously, and you know a bit of fortune on the Barca goal. Gundogan got a lucky, well, not a lucky read, but he made it happen by putting pressure on the defense yeah. on his way through and and getting that. You know, the bounce fell nicely for him off Alaba when he made that challenge. Um, but the finish was calm, and you know Barca were looking on top. Um, and then second half, Real Madrid start coming back into it a bit more. They start flipping the the momentum, and yeah, I mean. 
again, like Real Madrid got a bit lucky, I think. I don't think Modric meant to deflect the ball into Bellingham's uh, path on the winner. But I mean, there was nothing lucky about the equaliser because the equaliser was a rocket. Um, you know, that, that was a sort of goal that a big name player scores in a big game when his team are down 1 0, you know, to just get the ball out of his feet and hit it um, like he did in the corner. And then, like I say, the winner I thought was slightly fortuitous because that touch from Modric, he didn't mean to deflect it into Bellingham's path, but he did. And again, Bellingham was cool and, and took the finish well. So I think he's just every test that gets thrown at him right now he's just stepping up and it's amazing to see you know a young English player do that at this kind of level because it's frightening it's like he's he's so scarily consistent he looks so mature for like someone that's 20 years old um, Mm -hmm. that's already played in the championship that's already played in the Bundesliga that's already played in the Champions League that's already played at a World Cup and is now playing in La Liga and playing in Classicos at 20 years old. He's got all of that under his belt at 20 um, and is not phased by any of it. Um, and is just turning up in all the big moments. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, I mean, that's, that's the sort of thing he must've dreamed of when he signed for Real Madrid to, to score two goals, including the winner in a Classico away at Barca. That's, you know, like, I think if, you know, <laughs> if he, for some reason decided to turn around and retire tomorrow, like he's already lived the dream at Real Madrid. Like I know they can go on and win trophies and things, but like it doesn't get much bigger than than win scoring the goals in a classico away from home. That's that's huge there. Yeah. I mean, so whenever a goal gets scored, analysts try to overanalyze, you know, and it's like let's find out why this goal got scored. And let's start assigning blame. So on ESPN, they were like, Jude's first goal, they blamed it on. Is this a goalkeeping error? Nah, bro. That's no error. That was a rocket that yeah, appeared last minute on the, the right side of the fender, came out of nowhere. The goalkeeper did it his best to get near it. But that's all you were going to do was get near that. You weren't going to be able to touch that and stop that. That's a really good goalkeeper, you know? (laughs) Like, the guy scored, man. He just lashed it, and it was perfect, and it was a thunderbolt, and it was in the back of the net. That net is still shaking, you know what I mean? So don't be like, could the keeper say that? Was it a mistake? Nah, nah, nah. He he, he couldn't. No mistake. That's a goal. Celebrate the goal. And that's a goal. Mm-hmm. And then the second goal is even when things are bad for Real Madrid, in this El Clasico, it worked out because Modric is older now. So he doesn't, he's not as sharp as he used to be. So his mo- miscontrol, like if he was like younger and in his prime, Jude might not have scored that goal. It was his age and miscontrolling that ball and not being super sharp. He miscontrolled it into the path of Jude and then Jude put it away. So it's just like everything is working for Real Madrid, even the things that are working against them, you know? So, yeah, Jude, you know, pretty impressive performance. He popped up in the right moments when the club needed him and he's been doing that you know he's had some game winners but this is a real game winner now I I hope they win the league it would be great for him to win the league he just won Ballon d'Or's young player of the year Mm. so you know it's funny how old do you have to be to win the young player I'm not sure I think it goes up to 23 maybe Because how oh, under it, yeah, it's under under twenty ones. Under twenty one. So Harlan is not qualified for it anymore, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah, I'm assuming Harlan's like twenty three or something. 
he's old. So he could he's too old to win it. Because I was thinking they could have still gave it to him just because he's nominated for Ballon d'Or. It doesn't mean he can't win that. Yeah. But uh, I guess he's too old for it. But yeah, yeah, he did. I, but I do think it's based on the fact that he's at Real Madrid and he's what he's done in the last 10 games and also what he's done for England. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, he, he, he performed, you know, well at a World Cup and also he he got a Dortmund team to within one game of the Bundesliga title against, uh, you know, an all-conquering Bayern Munich team. So, and, and he didn't play in that final, in that last game or else... I think he was injured and on the bench. Like that last game of the season, if he'd have played, he could have mm-hmm. left Dortmund as a Bundesliga champs. As a matter of fact, that's the big uh, derby this weekend. Uh, I think Dortmund versus Bayern coming up. Yeah, what's up with the uh, Harry Kane yeah. uh, in his probably well. I mean, they've not played that many big games this season, Bayern. They played uh, Leverkusen. I think was probably the biggest one. Um. So, yeah, it'd be interesting to, to watch those guys square off. Yeah. Uh, what's up with the uh, the Fantasy League? Who's Oof. weird? I mean, I'm not sure I want to look because um, <laughs> I did not captain Haaland this week and he scored oh, two goals man. and got an assist. Because I've been sharing it around because other people have, like other players have been playing well. And his output isn't quite as hot this season as it had been in previous seasons. But I mean, prior to this weekend, um, let me just, my thing's logged out. Let me go in. Because I captained Watkins because I thought Villa against Luton, like Watkins will have a field day. And he played well, but he didn't, he didn't score a single goal. Um, so, yeah, I didn't have a great week. Always Captain Harlan. You guys taught me that last year. <laughs> Always captain. Yeah. Martin. Oh, I should have done. Uh, I mean, Martin didn't captain him either, but Martin captain Son, who scored a few goals. So, yeah, Martin is 14 points ahead of me right now. He's in 17th. I'm in 19th. So, we're pretty close. Neil's up in 12th. He hasn't moved. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, Thomas Moran is number one right now with Ronnie Pickering is his team. Um, but he had a good week. He didn't, he didn't captain. Uh, he captained Watkins as well. And then, but he's got Haaland in his team. He's got Darwin in his team. He's got Sobolai, Saka, Rice. They all scored big points. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he had a, he had a pretty hot week, and he jumped up to first. Aaron Firkin goes down to second place. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's a competitive league right now. Uh, I'm not that competitive um, with my team this year because I'm just yeah dropping points. Uh, I need to try and pick up the pace and. Uh, and try and climb up there because uh, I'm slipping. Yeah, you guys are supposed to be representing the podcast, man. Pick it up. <laughs> Focus, bro. <laughs> I, I would just, you know how you picked Ollie Watkins because it was Villa versus Luton. Like, <laughs> our defense with Johnny Evans, Maguire, and Lindelof starting as a left back is ba- basically Luton's defense. <laughs> so he's like, that's, that's when you do Captain Harlan. Like, you know, especially with Doku going down one side, passing the ball into him against, you know, poor goddamn old Johnny Evans. It's he, he's in, he's gonna Holland's gonna. This is a great game for Holland. You know what I mean? Against Slow Maguire, and uh, mm. and just going back to the United game. You know, <laughs> it's funny how Martin tried to pull those stats out. Talk about. Maguire's win percentage when he starts for United and how high it was. How did that win percentage help us against City this week? It didn't <laughs> at all. Like yeah, the numbers on the other side are coming down now. <laughs> yeah, that 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 stat got ripped up. And then I was watching <laughs> the goals that City scored against us, and the the two non penalties. You know what Maguire was doing. He was the only person not marking a man. He was marking a space. You know what I mean? Like the space don't score. The guy with the yeah. ball or the open man scores. And both times, if you watch it back, man, that dude is like getting to a space <laughs> that he thinks 
the Man City player is going to get to. I, but no, they're intelligent players. It's like, stop marking space, bro. Like, go to the ball. So that's, you know, that's where he's not a good defender, bro. He's not. Not on this level. He, he's not the reason for all our problems, but I'm just, just going to end it. I'm just going to end that. You know, I don't, I don't hate Maguire. <laughs> I don't want to, you know, he's, he's, he's gotten a lot, taken a lot of shit. So I ain't going to, yeah, but he was marking space. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I guess that's it. Uh, Southampton is fourth in the championship, doing their thing. Uh, United, I, I don't even know, want to know where we're at. Spurs is top of the table. That's weird. Martin behavior is also weird. He's not, you know, over exaggerating everything and saying that they're going to win the league. So that's good. But uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you all for watching. We appreciate you. You got any shows or stuff coming up? Anything you want to plug? Uh, yeah, I'm just about to post. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to post up my November uh, list of shows. Um, I've got stuff all over. I'm in London a bunch. I'm in Birmingham. I'm in Bristol. Um, I'm out in Essex and some other places. I'm up near Manchester towards the end of the month as well. Um, so I'm... I'm all over the country. Um, I'll post that up tomorrow. So if anyone listening wants to come check out a show, I will probably be near you at some point. But yeah, Lee Hudson Comedy on uh, on Instagram. Dope, dope. And uh, just follow me on Instagram at Ian Edwards Comic. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'll be in town a lot. You know, I go to Utah this weekend, but that's a military base. So... If you're listening from the military base, I don't even know what the base is. Come to the show. <laughs> but uh, in Salt Lake. But uh, yeah, thank you all for listening. Thank you all for watching. Like and subscribe on YouTube. Leave reviews on iTunes. Hit us up on Sound on SoundCloud, Omni Studio, Spotify. We love you. Be good. Be good to each other. One. <laughs>